Welcome to the Global Medical Device Podcast, where today's brightest minds in the medical device industry go to get their most useful and actionable insider knowledge, direct from some of the world's leading medical device experts and companies. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Etienne Nichols, and I'm the host of today's episode. In today's episode, we spoke with Kevin Becker on what is the topic of his book, Quality Myths and Lessons Learned. Kevin has written and spoken at conferences on his experience as a quality engineer. We talked about things like, what's the most important part of a QMS? What are the six words that cause more problems than any other in med tech? What are some situations you can expect to face in quality and should be prepared to handle? And much more. Kevin has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Minnesota and a master's degree in reliability engineering from the University of Maryland. Kevin, he's also an ASQ certified quality engineer, reliability engineer, and Six Sigma black belt with experience as a quality reliability engineer, manager, director of engineering, director of quality in the medical device field. He's trained engineers, technicians, executives, managers, and supervisors in quality and reliability methods, statistical techniques, and risk management methods. Kevin has authored and co-authored published papers in the areas of reliability, probabilistic risk assessment, and measurement correlation. Has written a book titled Quality Myths and Lessons Learned. I've already mentioned. He also has a second edition coming out, hopefully towards the end of next year, but we'll try to keep you posted on that. He's helped companies in this industry improve effectiveness and efficiency by adapting QE, RE, and RM methods. And he's also created new methods from basic principles in the areas of FMEA, FTA, SPC accelerated testing, risk management, Monte Carlo simulation, regression analysis, hypothesis testing, design of experience, acceptance, sampling, statistical modeling, MSA process, product validation, and quality reliability management principles. I heard his presentation on the topics in his book anyway, the things he's learned in Minneapolis at the, an ASQ conference, and I just had to have him on. He has a ton of experience. I hope you enjoy this episode with Kevin Becker as much as I enjoyed making it. Hey, everyone. It's good to be back with you today. Today with me is Kevin Becker, author of Quality Myths and Lessons Learned. Kevin, it's so great to have you on the show. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. How have you been doing? I'm doing good. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I got to hear you at the Minnesota ASQ Quality Conference. I was a little confused because it was like five conferences in one, but I really enjoyed your presentation and since got your book. Yeah. So you want to tell us just a little bit, I know you had a disclaimer you wanted to give, so I'll let you do that at this point too. Yeah. I have what I refer to as, as my day job. I'm a director of quality at a, a med device component manufacturer, but I also have a consulting business on the side. And this is part of the consulting business. I'm not representing my employer. And the disclaimer is none of the specific examples come from my current employer or my day job. As I refer to it, they all come from other sources. Yeah. Okay. Well, appreciate that. And I can totally understand. Sometimes when I'm going through my background or giving a story, I'm thinking, okay, what specific details should I leave out? And I know that for quality minded people, that's going to be a struggle. So I appreciate and respect that 100%. So one thing that I'm curious about, so I've read the book, I actually have a lot of pages dog eared and some things highlighted. But before I get into that, I'm curious, what actually prompted you to actually take the time to write all of these things down? Actually, I'll start with what prompted me to start the consulting business. Uh, yeah. I worked at Hutchinson Technology for 28 years. They did a great job of training us. Okay. So, and I started there fresh out of school when I was really young. I thought everybody knew this stuff. Okay. HTI made suspension assemblies for rigid disk drives and computers. You don't see them around very much anymore. It all went to flash. So I ended up leaving HTI. And, and after I left HTI, I kind of realized that Nobody knows this stuff. And that's an exaggeration, but I mean, I was surprised at how little it was known out there. And then I'm engineering by training and at heart. And I was in a management role with a lot of the more of the soft skills. And I kind of felt my technical abilities slip away, if you will. And I decided, no, that's not going to happen. So I started a consulting business focusing on a lot of technical training and then the book was an offshoot of all of what I just mentioned. You know, the fact that I get asked the same questions over and over again, I end up solving the same problems over and over again. And that's true in the consulting business when I work with clients as well, that a lot of the same questions arise. So when you said a lot of people don't know this, or maybe nobody knows this, I know it's an exaggeration, but if nobody knows this, can you give us an example of one of the things that really stood out to you as a shocker that nobody knows? 
Well, there are a bunch of them. There's probably but, 34 um, based on the ones in your book. <laughs> yeah, 34. There's more than 34 because I'm working on a second edition of and I'm excited for it. <laughs> of the yeah. book. You know, one example is that a Fortune 500 company had us using R squared linear regression for measurement correlation between two pieces of measurement equipment. And it turned out that our process was very capable to the point where the capability of the process made the measurement system look bad when the measurement system actually was performing great. The CPK was on the order of 12. I mean, and a measurement has to be taken for every part in the CPK. I've had that question arise though multiple times after that. I mean, we ended up working with that Fortune 500 company, we came to an agreement, but that's come up two or three times after that. Things like statistical control. I've had customers tell me that if R squared is low, your measurement process is out of control. Well, look at the math. They have nothing to do with one another, absolutely nothing. People still get statistical control mixed up with parts being in or out of tolerance. They have nothing to do with one another. The tolerance shows up nowhere in the control limit or control chart formulas that are used to determine whether or not you're in control. Things like that. People, there's still confusion about, well, what is the job of a quality inspector or a quality auditor? I've had some people tell me the job is to find defects. Well, that leads people to over-inspect. If you're talking about auditing a QMS system, it leads the auditor to maybe make up a requirement that isn't really part of the standard, and that leads to inefficiencies in the system. So I would say finding a defect is not the job of a quality inspector or quality auditor. Some people will say it's to get the parts out the door. Well, I think the downside of that is obvious, right? Then we ship maybe defective product or whatever. So I simply define it as find and report the truth. Just if we're doing great, tell me we're doing great, and I'll go fix a real problem. If we're having problems, tell me exactly which problems we're having so I can fix them. Yeah. Things like that. So I actually had a conversation. I was talking to somebody yesterday about this, about the way you incentivize good or bad behavior, or you may not even realize it. Like you mentioned, you just gave a couple examples. If the QC inspector thinks their job is to find defects, and however you incentivize that, whether you say, okay, so many defects found, you know, it gets some sort of reward. You've incentivized really scrutinizing and looking for issues rather than what you said is the true job, which is searching for the truth and reporting the truth. I noticed when I read your book, you have lots of different examples where you show if you are doing this, you're incentivizing this potentially bad behavior. How do you exercise or grow that muscle of realizing what you're incentivizing? Can you expound a little bit on that? I think it's similar to the FMEA concept. You try and figure out what could possibly go wrong. How could somebody possibly misinterpret this? Communication is another issue that is really difficult for engineers. They should be good at it, but they're not. But a couple of examples of incentivizing the wrong behavior, we had competition from one shift to the next, okay? So get how many parts you get out, hopefully all good parts, but that led to a behavior where somebody might run a tool past the point where it should have been repaired, and then the next shift would have to deal with it. But the problem is that turned a 20-minute repair into maybe a six-hour repair. Bad for the company, right? Good for the shift based on how the incentives were set up, but bad for the company. I had an example where I was department manager, we had a budget to control too, and the rating scale at the end of the year for performance was set up that the only way you could get the highest rating is to come in under budget. You can't get a high rating by being right or being accurate. And I sat down with the plant manager and I said, okay, you're giving me a choice between being foolish or dishonest. There's no way to honestly win this game because if I'm not going to be foolish, I'm going to pad the budget knowing that I can come in under budget, but what good does that do to the company? And if I'm going to be honest, then I'm locking myself out of a good performance appraisal. So in that case, I was able to negotiate with the plant manager to get a rating that focused more on being right as opposed to being under. But my goal was to maybe change the culture of the company. That didn't happen. I just got my own performance rating adjusted. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I guess that's a, a small win, maybe not winning the battle. Yeah. And it kind of segues a little bit because you mentioned something, you know, dishonest. If you pad the budget, maybe that's dishonest. And I know you're working on the second edition of the book, you said, and one of the chapters I think we mentioned was on ethics. 
I wondered if you could tell us a little bit, maybe give us a sneak preview on what might be included in that or what a quality engineer specifically might be interested in when it comes to ethics. Yeah, I'll probably start with a story that's embarrassed, still embarrassing to me 40 years after the fact, okay? But it's going to be in the book, so I have to be used to talking about it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so I was a young engineer and had a young wife and toddler at home living paycheck to paycheck. And we messed up an experiment that I needed to report to the customer. I went to my manager and said, hey, we messed this up. We're going to have to start over. And he looked at me and said, no, we didn't mess it up. Part number one measured 28 and part number two measured 32. And part, you know, it was just making up numbers. The implication was obvious, make up data to give to the customer, which isn't real, it's falsifying data, essentially. The embarrassing part is I did it. And the reason is what I mentioned, young wife and toddler at home, paycheck to paycheck. Well, I lost sleep for two or three nights, finally decided that the job isn't worth the principal. And I went in and essentially told the manager, I said, don't ever ask me to do that again. Um, no, thinking that I might be out of a job five minutes after that fact. It turned out actually quite well in the sense that I worked closely with that manager for many years. After that, we never talked about it again. He never asked me to do anything like that again, but I did it the one time. And I think the moral for that one is if you're a manager, understand that people might accept bad direction because of their life situation. If you're a new engineer, I would say, you know, realize that you might be put in that situation and it's probably better to think about it a little bit in advance as opposed to in the moment, not knowing what to do. Yeah, that's a really good point because I remember a young engineer coming to me at one point where it's not quite the same situation, but, and I was young at the time too. I'm I like to think of maybe I'm still young, but he came to me and it was during an FDA audit where we were, it was a guided inspection. They were looking for certain pieces of data. They were looking at certain inspection things that we had done. And one of the items he had printed off in color, you know, it was the inspection was out. It was in red. And so he came to me and said, the director of quality wants me to print this in black and white before we take it into the FDA inspector so that maybe he'll miss the fact that we passed something that was out of tolerance. What should I do? I'm like, well, you know, that's weird. And I don't know. I, maybe I'll just present that to you. Like the data is still going to be presented, the true data, but we've tried to hide it by printing it in black and white or whatever. I don't know. Curious what your thoughts are, because it's such a gray area. It felt like a gray area to me, too. I don't think that's a good idea to try and hide it. Because yeah. we had some training not too long ago, and the trainer used to be an FDA inspector. And he said that if the FDA designates a company as sneaky, which that sounds pretty sneaky to me, yeah. Yeah. they might be back every six months instead of every two years. And then they're probably going to look harder. Yeah. To me, that doesn't sound like a good idea. <laughs> no. Interesting. And well, I totally agree. And that's, he and I sort of decided that together. We being lowly manufacturing engineers, thinking about a director, you know, presenting data. So looking back on that's kind of interesting to think about. But the fact that you said the designation of sneaky, I mean, that basically is saying one employee could impact an entire organization yeah. and their FDA inspection schedule. I think I have actually another example on the subject of ethics, which I think is important to go to. It was Years ago, and a manufacturing manager asked me to have a conversation in the cafeteria. Well, cafeteria conversations are off the record, right? Yeah. He wanted me to make a decision. And I think his exact words were, there's a pile of money out there and we should grab our share while it's still there. And the decision he wanted me to make would have been good in the short term. In other words, year-end bonus. Think year-end bonus. So it would have been good for us in the short term. But I was 90 plus percent confident in the long term, it'd be bad for the company. So I declined to make that decision. But the gray area is, what if I was only 80% confident it was going to be a bad long-term decision? What if it was 70? What if it was 50-50? Knowing that it would be good in the short term for me personally, what if there's a 30% chance that it would be bad long-term? So the point being, there can be a lot of gray area, even in ethics. When I was 90% certain it was bad for the long-term health of the company, the ethics are clear. No, I can't make that decision. But think about what if it wasn't 90? What if it was less than 90? At some point, we all have to draw a line. And I'm even open to the idea that people can draw lines in different places than I do. And that doesn't mean somebody is right or wrong. But yeah, it's not always quite black and white. I respect that you say that about it's like a risk-based approach. So 
like that conversation you had, if you make that decision, same way we decide a lot of the things with designing and developing our products, then you also should be willing to be audited potentially later. You know, it's somebody say, yeah. oh, you made this decision. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Well, I'm just going to open up one more. Let's see. There was a, something I wanted to ask. The five worst possible answers. Well, I thought was a good chapter in your book. The worst possible answer, right? The worst possible. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'm looking at the chapter page. Yeah. yeah, the worst possible answer. You know, I first looked through them. I thought, oh, the wrong answer makes sense. Answer that costs a lot of money. Answer we don't like. Answers that create a lot of work. But I wonder if you could expound or maybe tell some stories about what you think the worst possible answer is to a question. Yeah, for me, it's a two-part answer. And the worst possible is wrong, but believable. Because if it's believable, we're likely to act on it. And if it's wrong, we're going to take the wrong action on it. You know, my first example on that one is actually all not work related. And I do have my wife's permission to share this. But uh, a number of years back, she had a positive marker for ovarian cancer. Okay. I looked on the internet and found out that if you, with that positive test and certain symptoms, there's greater than a 90% likelihood that it's true. And the symptoms were there as well. Without going into a lot of detail, six weeks and a major surgery later, we found out it was a false positive. You can kind of imagine probably what those six weeks were like, and then don't forget there was a major surgery thrown in there that ended up being false positive anyway. We bring it into the work realm. I was an engineer. I got a call on a weekend, and they said, all of our measurement equipment is failing. So we had to use real parts to monitor our measurement equipment because there was no NIST standard that we could use in this particular case. And the parts were fragile. They could be damaged. So the question was, do we shut down our entire operation? Well, the 24-7 operation, we were making millions of parts a week, literally millions a week. So the decision was a seven-figure decision. So on the one hand, we had... The parts said the measurement equipment is bad, but we had multiple pieces of measurement equipment. They all agreed with one another. Well, we knew the parts were fragile, so we had a backup, right? We had a backup set of parts. The backup parts also said the measurement equipment was bad by about the same amount in about the same direction. So we have two extremely unlikely events. Number one unlikely event is all the measurement equipment went bad at the same time. The second extremely unlikely event is both sets of parts that we use to monitor the equipment went bad in the same direction at the same time. I ended up making the decision that we would keep running and it wasn't because I figured out one was right and the other one was wrong. It was because we were at a point where we couldn't make enough parts to satisfy demand. And I know if, if I made the wrong decision, we could fix it Monday and the cost would be high and bad parts produced. But if I shut everything down, that capacity was never recoverable. It was gone forever. So it was. if I made the wrong decision, it was expensive in either direction, but one was more recoverable than the other. Turns out we had a sister company four hours away. We got their backup set of parts, brought them in, found out the measurement equipment was right. For some reason our parts went bad, never figured out why or what happened there. But both of them were believable. One was wrong, but both were believable. Mm, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So if we tie that together with what you're saying about CPK and PPK, a wrong but believable, potentially, depending on your experience with those tools. I also want to tie that back and just tying three things together. So work with me here. But you mentioned the people who don't know anything about some of this, but they're coming out and they're working in the field. How does someone see that wrong but believable answer, maybe see these tools, but doesn't have the experience to use those how do they know when they don't know? You know what I mean? How do they get to the point where they recognize, you know, maybe I don't know something here? Yeah, and I think it's an interesting point you brought up because part of the reason I even went down that road of wrong but believable is because it can happen so easily in statistics. And, you know, in the book, there's an example where we had to calculate CPK to accept a lot of product or job of product. And there were 50 numbers and I had to approve it. And I looked down the 50 numbers and I, I told the QC inspector, I said, I think you punched the wrong button on your calculator. Would you please re-enter it? And she looked at me like I was crazy. And <laughs> you can't calculate standard deviation in your head, 50 numbers. And she was right. Hopefully not that I'm crazy, but that I can't calculate standard deviation of 50 numbers. But what I can do is 
find the smallest and largest and do the range in my head. And I know that mathematically, one standard deviation cannot be larger than the range. How does that happen? You forget a decimal point. That's how it happens. So that doesn't answer your question, how does one know what you don't know? But that's an example of, again, a wrong but believable. That one was believable because occasionally our process would produce results that failed in that manner. But the way to do it is to study the subject matter, right? I mean, you have to go to school, ASQ certifications. <laughs> I have a number of certifications. Learn the science behind what we're doing and make sure that you're competent at it. Yeah. Never stop hammering on your craft. That's really good. Another thing I was thinking about, so I had a conversation with several people yesterday and, and some of these things are bubbling up into my head here, but when you're talking about just continuing down that road of hammering on your craft, becoming proficient in your field, you know, QEs, and I actually kind of lump HF almost, human factors and quality engineers, for some reason, they've gotten a bad PR over the years. And maybe this is getting better. I don't know. But I remember when I was in manufacturing, just kind of watching product development and quality engineering go back and forth. And, you know, I tried to stay out of it, but sometimes you get sucked in. Product development seemed to have a little bit of a, they didn't really want QE getting involved in their stuff. Maybe they didn't want human factors getting involved in their stuff. And I've been thinking about this lately. Why is that? And I think inherently a product development engineer thinks and maybe they're right to a certain degree, we try to include human factors in our design of a product. We try to include quality measures in the development of our product. What do you have to offer me? And I may be taking the devil's advocate side here, but I wonder what your answer would be to that. I have my own answers or thoughts on it, but I'm really curious what your thoughts are. I think there's another reason. I've been around a few decades. Okay. Yeah. And I think this part is getting better. Hopefully it is. But if you go back far enough, the quality department used to be where some companies would dump the engineers that didn't quite cut it in other engineering departments. Mm. So there were a fair number of people who really didn't study the science and really didn't understand what was really going on. So I think that's part of it. I think part of it is quality department has to deliver bad news a lot of times, right? I mean, we're the ones digging through the data to find what's not working. And we're often focusing on what's not working so we can fix it, right? They don't spend a lot of time focusing on what is working. So I think that for maintaining credibility, the first one is you have to be competent. We've talked about that a bit already. I think a second one is you have to be willing to help solve the problem. You can't be the person that just comes in and points the finger and then walks away and kind of, you know, brushes their hands. You have to actually be willing to help the problem. If you fix the problem, if you find out that we didn't follow a procedure, well, maybe the procedure wasn't clear. So maybe I should be the one volunteering to fix the procedure or to clarify it instead of just pointing out that the procedure is bad and somebody needs to fix it. That'll go a long way towards I think, correcting the perception, if you will. Another thing is to be reasonable as well, right? I mean, I've seen instances where somebody will reject a document for a typo that everybody knows the word is supposed to be the, not T-H without the E. And that rejection could cause a couple of weeks of rework, depending on you know what the approval process is. And I usually take the approach that if the intent is crystal clear, I'm not going to reject for something like that because it creates resentment among others. And the long game is a working relationship because we all have to work together, right? I'm not willing to give up the long game for the short game. So I will not, for example, reject a document based on a small technicality that has no practical impact to the business. I really respected that when you wrote that, because when I was reading something similar in your book, I thought it was funny how you said, it's actually difficult for me to write this article because <laughs> the perfectionist in me, and I respect that. But that's a really good point. You know, I've argued sometimes if someone wants to correct your grammar about, instead of saying, I'm trying to think of an example here, the place I want to go to versus, or the thing I want to do versus in which I want to do, you know, the, the in which the point of communication is to convey your thought. And so if you've done that, you've accomplished your goal. Obviously, there may be better ways to do it, but I really respect that. I want to use that thought that you said as far as sequential approval and how long it can take sometimes and really understanding the process, because I've experienced that where you have a change order that sits on a desk 
for a while and finally they get around to rejecting it and it's already been through you know regulatory and doc control and so forth and now it's been rejected by product development it has to go all the way through that again one of the things you talked about in your book was flow charts and understanding the flow of how those things should work and how to make them a little bit more efficient i'm getting to a question here so thank you for your patience but the question i have is I've heard people say in your SOPs, if you put flow charts in there, you can actually set yourself up for a trap. And there's two things here, flow charts in general for your process and then flow charts for your SOPs. But if specifically for your SOPs, do you agree with that? Do you disagree? How does that work with updating those things and making sure you're not putting it in writing as well as a flow chart and tripping yourself up? Yeah, I've been caught by that. Auditors, right? Auditors will catch you and say, well, your procedure says something different than your flow chart says. And I guess to jump right to the answer, whenever I write a procedure like that, I put a statement along the lines of, in case of any discrepancy, the text takes precedence over the flowchart. And it's really tough for an auditor to write a finding. They can point it out and say, hey, you should really fix this. But it's really tough for them to write a finding. So yes, it is an audit trap, but there's an easy way around it. Hmm. Okay. Well, I think you found option C for me that I'm <laughs> <laughs> false dichotomy, Etienne. Okay. What about flowcharts in general? How are some, can you give some examples of how they work now that I have a gate to use them? <laughs> yeah. I like flowcharts because they can take very confusing text and make it easy to follow. And they, they also point out gaps in the process, right? Like the one you're referring to is a serial approval process that could be made parallel and essentially cut off 80% of the approval time. And it's very easy to present to management the difference between the serial and the parallel. And especially if you have data on the times taken for the serial process, it's easy then to just point to, well, the longest one is the total time if you do it in parallel, as opposed to adding them all together. Yeah, that makes sense. Another issue that I've seen with a flow chart towards that, maybe it's in the appendix, wherever it is, the flow chart you have to print off in engineering, you know, massive paper because they have mapped out the entire process and you have to get your magnifying glass out to look at it. Do you have specific guidelines in setting up those flow charts, like size, whatever, that makes it actually possible to be a tool rather than a hindrance? First off, I like linear flow charts. I've seen some flowcharts that have a lot of circular loops, and I don't think they help make things clearer. I think they actually tend to confuse the issue. If they get large, I'll just have them as multiple pages, and I'll have connectors that go from one page to the next. I hear what you're saying. I've seen that. I don't find that to be very helpful. I should say it's helpful for the people putting it together. It's not helpful for communicating to others. So if I'm communicating to others, I would generally try and break it up into smaller chunks and then have connectors in strategic places. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess really the point I would want to, or that I'm sort of drawing from what you're saying is remember the why, remember the reason you're putting that together, not to be pretty, not to be fancy. <laughs> yeah, it's to communicate. Yeah. Always start with the objective in mind, right? Or start with the end in mind. Exactly. So what are some other quality myths and lessons learned? I saw that you had 34. I don't know how many you're adding to the second edition. What are some of the ones that are maybe your top favorites? Actually, the second edition is going to expand the scope a little bit beyond myths and lessons learned maybe. But one of them is having a principle-based business or decision-making process. And that came over the years, uh, you know, in quality, you get asked to do a lot of things that might not be considered ethical. And, and to be fair, a lot of them are just plain out of ignorance, right? Somebody will say, well, you probably found the only defect in the whole job. Can't we just sample it again? And that's really an ignorance question. They believe what they're saying, but in the quality field, that's known as, you know, unethical practice because it's well known that even if a job is 10% defective, if you sample enough, often enough, eventually you'll find it. One sample that passes and that's not considered appropriate practice, but you get put in a lot of situations. So I started to go off of Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he talks about living your life according to a set of principles. And I thought, well, why wouldn't that work for business? It, even maybe more important for business. There's an example in the book. I say, you know, the, start with four principles. The first one is we're going to obey the regulations. Second one is we're going to comply with quality agreements for, that we have with customers. 
Third one, we're going to follow internal procedures subject to one and two. And then the fourth one is we're going to do things as efficiently as possible subject to one, two, and three. And I found that that really helps me to have that in the background because, you know, I can be involved in discussions. Well, we found a problem. Do we tell the customer? Do we not tell the customer? Well, to me, that's the wrong question because it has a really easy answer. What does the quality agreement say? What do the regulations say? If they say we tell the customer, we tell the customer. It's that simple. The question then is how do we tell a customer? Because it doesn't do anybody any good to present false information or to present even the wrong impression of what's really going on. Are we even sure of our data? I mean, are we positive that we have a problem? <laughs> Sending a customer on a wild goose chase, as they say, does not help anybody. But it changes the whole discussion if the question is not do we, rather the question is how do we? And it really helps move forward because there can be a lot of pressure to avoid something that might be embarrassing or expensive or a lot of work, if you will. Yeah. So I found that having that basis of principles, and there are more, that, that's just a brief example. I think another example of it in there is DHR, device history record in the medical device industry. That is the story of how the parts were built, right? And it has to tell the complete story. Well, what if you run into a case where this paper is messy and it needs to be rewritten to present to the customer and they, even the customer wants it neat right can you rewrite it or can you not rewrite it and i think if you understand the purpose of a dhr the answer is yes you can rewrite it if you keep the original and you clearly annotate somewhere maybe on both the original and the copy that this was recopied for clarity reasons right so you keep both records you're not hiding anything at that point. You're doing what the customer asked for, you're still complying with the intent of a DHR. That is a really great point because I can remember actually running into that issue where only one person can read this other person's writing. And that's just a, a really eloquent way to handle that situation. The hierarchy of principles too is something that I'd like to emphasize, I guess, because when I read that or saw it in your presentation in Minnesota, I think that was really powerful. Regulations first, then internal quality, pres agreement. Yeah. quality yeah. agreement, right? And just understanding what's going to supersede something else. I thought that was really fantastic. Yeah. And I think part of that chapter too is a normalization of deviance. I think that ties in here as well. I first found out about it in an article in the Star Tribune, the Minneapolis newspaper. It was a person from the financial industry who just got out of jail and he described a culture where it was very competitive. So to get your bonus, you had to start pushing the rules a little bit, and then everybody was pushing the rules. And to get the larger bonus, you had to actually break the rules and start pushing ethics until so everybody did that. Then to get the biggest bonus, you had to become unethical, and it eventually led to a point where you had to break the law to get the biggest bonus. Well, he did that. He got caught. He went to jail. He got out of jail, told the story. If you do a search on Google, you can find a bunch of other examples. The space shuttle with the foam that broke off and damaged heat tiles, that had happened in previous flights and originally caused a lot of consternation, but it became accepted as the norm until the one shuttle catastrophe. And going back to those principles also helps us recognize when we might be starting down the path of normalization of deviance. It can happen to any business. And the insidious thing is it happens slowly over a period of months or years, and it happens in small steps. So it's not always easy to recognize. But if you have that firm foundation in principles, I think it makes it much easier to recognize. And the goal of any company should be recognize it long before it gets to the point of an ethical or even worse legal consideration, and then take action to correct it in a timely fashion. Yeah. I appreciate you putting the links to the articles in your book as well, because I actually, even though I had to type them out, I actually went to some of those and read about the Challenger and so forth with the foam. That was really interesting. You've probably already written the second book, but I highly recommend that again, because that was helpful. It was really cool. Do you read a lot of other books just out of curiosity? Yeah, I've told this story too often, but I actually bought a calculus book. I have it on the TV stand next to the chair in the <laughs> living room. So when the commercials are boring, I might read calculus. I got a free book at the Minnesota Quality Conference because I spoke up and they were just trying to encourage participation. And I thought that one might be a waste of time, but I'm finding it to actually be very interesting and useful. 
Which one is that? Hero Semiconductor. I'm, I can't remember the name of it offhand. I wasn't planning on talking about yeah, it. Today, no. <laughs> but it dealt with Harris Semiconductor as a company and how they really turned around some problems in one of their facilities. And it actually touches on some of the things that uh, we've been talking about today. Yeah. There's another book I was actually thinking, I actually wasn't planning to talk about this either. Honestly, I have books on my desk because I'm pretty much reading all the time, but Howard Root's Cardiac Arrest. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. I think it might be a Minnesota Mm -hmm. company, but it's Cardiac Arrest, five years as a CEO on the Fed's hit list, an issue they got into with ad promo, which might be interesting. It's a little downstream from manufacturing, but so the reason I brought that up is when you were talking about the normalization of deviance. I actually glanced down. I just finished this book. I actually don't know if I recommend it. It's too heavy. It's called Ordinary Men, The Reserve Police Battalion 101 and the Final Solution in Poland by Christopher Browning. No, I'm not familiar with that one. This is basically the entire book is about the subject you're talking about, normalization of deviance. And I actually wanted to read the last thing because not to push back on what you're saying about it happening in steps, because I think that is the way it happens in business. I totally agree. But he talks about how instantaneous it can happen. This is basically 500. I'm sorry about this. I hope you forgive me this tangent. But a group of 500 people from Hamburg sent to Poland, civilians, mostly non-military background, commanded to do horrible things. And his conclusion, after looking at a lot of different studies, he says, I fear that we live in a world in which war and racism are ubiquitous, in which the powers of government mobilization and legitimization are powerful and increasing and in which a sense of personal responsibility is increasingly attenuated by specialization and bureaucratization, and in which the peer group exerts tremendous pressure on behavior and sets moral norms. And this is the phrase that I wanted you to hear. In such a world, I fear modern governments that wish to commit mass murder will seldom fail in their efforts for being unable to induce ordinary men to become their willing executioners. Now, that's a very extreme and heavy example, but it kind of plays exactly what you're saying. I believe that it can happen quickly. I think in business, it's more often or more common to have the slow and insidious where it just, we slowly migrate away from, you know, another example would be, well, you know, the procedure says this, but we don't really do it that way. We really do it this way. And then that attitude or that culture progresses throughout the organization to the point where pretty soon we're not following anything that our procedures say, because we just don't do that. Well, that's another example of potentially normalization of deviance. It also ties back into that embarrassing story I told, though, that people sometimes will react in ways they would not normally react due to, I didn't say peer pressure, but, you know, superior manager, whatever direction, peer pressure is a big part of it as well. And I've seen peer pressure in discussions in this industry or in businesses where Yeah, it goes back to the principle-based thing, right? Again, because that's the best way I found to overcome the peer pressure. It's like, no, I can't do that. It's it's an important point because young engineers, they may think this is the only opportunity. This is my job. What other options do I have? Like if I get fired, how do I get another job? I mean, I don't know if you have any examples of this or thoughts. I'm sure you've hired different people. What are your thoughts if someone gave a story like that during an interview or do you have any interview stories you might share? It's actually a tough one because if you're only hearing one side in an interview, right? If I got the sense that the person was being straightforward and honest, I would view it as a positive rather than a negative. But you have to walk that line where you can't be seen as bashing your former employer in an interview. You have to tell the truth. You have to answer the question. It's kind of a fine line. But as long as I thought that the person was being honest, I would view it as a positive, not a negative. As far as the general concept about where would I find my next job, I think people get more nervous about that than need be. If you've got a solid background, right? You've got, you know, education experience. You said not much experience, but you've got the education. I think it's not the end of the world that some people think it might be. Yeah. Especially if you have that calculus book sitting on your table that you read. When you're bored. Yeah, I'm not sure I should have told that story. <laughs> no, people think I'm weird already. That's not good. <laughs> Well, I think as an engineer, you're supposed to have some of those nuances. So that's good. (laughs) So this has been really great. I really appreciate you taking the time. Do you have any other just thoughts that you'd like to drop for the listeners today that you think would be beneficial? 
Yeah, most important part of a quality management system. That's another one that I think people don't always understand. I hear a lot of things. Some people might say the CAPA system is the most important part. Some people might say document control, measurement. If you don't measure it, you can't improve it, whatever. But I can rebut any of those with a couple simple questions. You know, let's start with the CAPA one. CAPA system is most important. Well, what if the CAPA owner's manager says, I need you to work on these other things, not the CAPA that's been assigned to you? What if you say document control is the most important? The rebuttal would be, what if the CEO is the person putting post-it notes on the equipment, telling people to do something different than what the procedure says? Or if CEO is too extreme for you, middle manager, lead, supervisor, you know, whatever. But what if management is the one telling people not to follow the document control system? Measurement. What if you need a CMM and you have a ruler? Well, who authorizes <laughs> purchase of <laughs> CMM? Somebody challenged me on it just recently and said that, well, quality is everybody's responsibility. You're giving a free ride to those people by saying it's management. And my response to that was, who sets the culture? Who sets the expectation that quality is everyone's responsibility? I think my answer is clear. Management responsibility is the most important part of a QMS. Without management support, we can achieve local victories, small ones, but we're never going to achieve the big cultural victory. So I think that is the most important part of a QMS. And that one's one that I wanted to bring up today. That's a great point. I appreciate you bringing that up. Just to add one question onto the back of that, are there things that you see management doing better than others in that management responsibility to promote that culture of quality? I think the whoever is the top management in the site has to be out front promoting it, talking about it. See, often where you get people asking maybe 10 times a day, are we getting the parts out? And then once a quarter in a all employee meeting, you talk about quality. Well, you talk to psychologists, whatever. I'm not a psychologist, but at some point, I think it boils down to what you ask about the most is what comes across as most important to people. And if you ask about output 10 times a day and quality once a quarter, I think it's clear to most people what the priority is. Great point. That's very good. All right. Where can people go either find your second book? What's it coming out, by the way? Do you know? Well, that's my side gig, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping by the end of 23, it's not that close. I just actually committed myself to doing it in the last month or two, but it is my side gig. So I can't tell you for sure when it's coming out. Sorry. That's fair. No worries. We'll put in the show notes how to find your first book, which I still, I mean, it's fantastic. So I'll put links to there. Where can people find you? Are you active in any way in social media? It's okay if not. <laughs> I do have LinkedIn account. Okay. I'm not that active on it. I Check it when I get notified that something changed, but I, I'm not very active on it in general. But that's really the social media. Yeah, the book is on Amazon. It's second edition will probably be black and white because it'll be a heck of a lot cheaper. The color makes it a little more spendy, but sure. Cool. Um, All right. Well, we'll put links to your LinkedIn and so forth. So if as the audience have a question for Kevin or want to reach out and talk more, feel free to do that. This is great. Thank you so much, Kevin. I really appreciate you taking the time to visit with us today and we'll let you get back to it. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Just a few of the points I took away from the conversation were management responsibility is the most important part of a QMS. Send me a message if you disagree. I'd love to hear what your take is on that. Also, as a quality professional, ethical considerations are part of your job. And it's up to quality to mend the broken PR image that historically has been viewed on quality professionals. And part of the way to do that is to recognize what hills are truly worth dying on and is a typo that doesn't change the meaning of the document one of those hills. If you enjoyed this episode, reach out to Kevin Becker on LinkedIn. Let him know. Also, I'd personally love to hear from you via email, etienne.nichols at greenlight.guru, or look me up on LinkedIn. You can learn all about what we do if you head over to www.greenlight.guru. We're the only medtech lifecycle excellence platform. And on top of that, we've built a community where you can go to join the conversation or learn more about the things we discuss on the podcast. You can find those at community.greenlight.guru or academy.greenlight.guru. Finally, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. It helps others find us and it lets us know how we're doing. Thanks again. Have a great time.